Welcome to The Snap with Alexis Perry and Sydney Jones. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Broncos Podcast Network and YouTube for this week's edition of The Snap. I'm Sydney Jones, your host, joined by my co-host, Alexis Perry. Alexis, the wait is finally over. Week one of the 2021 regular season is officially here, and I'm so excited. As you know, I always love the start of the season. You know, optimism is high. Expectations are high. We're still undefeated. I know this is the best time of year, Sid, and there is just so much to look forward to with the depth added to this team. Thanks to the draft and free agency. I feel like this team heading into this 2021 season, they have the tools to be a playoff team. And, you know, I know the goal for this team year in and year out has always and will always be the Super Bowl, but they just need to take a really big first step this year. And I think that's winning in September, right? So you have the Giants, the Jags and the Jets. So a win on Sunday in the Meadowlands will really get this train rolling in the right direction. And, you know, I think they are the favorites heading into this one. So I'm excited to see how it plays out. You and I both now just one more day until the Broncos hit the road to East Rutherford to take on the New York Giants. And here to get us up to speed on this matchup is Fox Sports NFL reporter and the sideline reporter for this weekend's game, Shannon Spake. Shannon, it's so nice to meet you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, I really appreciate you reaching out. I, I love chatting uh, before the game, especially right now, because I feel like all of us, we have like all of this information in our head from all of training camp and preseason. And, and we're just like, we, we just can't wait for, for all of this to start and for us to just be able to get it all out. So it's it's cool to catch up with you guys. What do you look forward to most here kind of on the eve, eve of the season opener? What are you looking forward to this year? Being back on the sidelines. Last year, as you guys know, was so unique. I know I saw you guys doing the draft from your hotel room and on your Instagram and being in the first row, it, it's just, it, listen, it's covering football and it was awesome. And, and I'll, I'll take it any way I can get it. But at the same time, you really miss that, that being right there, feeling the energy, watching the guys walk off the field, uh, talking to the players pregame. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, just kind of get to know them, even even talk to them about stuff that's not football related, their families or their lives or where they went to college, the game that they watched yesterday. So I, I definitely miss that interaction. I'm really looking forward to that this this year. I know. And it doesn't feel the same without all the fans there, right? So I've told this story a couple of times. Week one last year, we were in Detroit. It was Detroit, Chicago. And Adrian Peterson, who was playing for Detroit, um, he popped off for like a 20-something yard run. And I was standing behind the Bears bench in the first row. And I kind of let out a scream because I'm a football fan, you know? And like when it's someone like Adrian Peterson, like he does something, anything, right? You're, you're excited because it's Adrian Peterson. And, and so I let out this little like whoop, like a whoop, and like the Bears players <laughs> turned around and looked at me because I was literally right behind their bench. And I was kind of like, hi. And yeah, you realize that, you know, cause they're pumping some of the crowd noise into your IFB and you can, right. you can hear that, but you forget when though, when you went to commercial break or if there was an injury or something, that place went quiet. It was dead quiet. One of the weirdest things, uh, one of the strangest environments I should, I should say is, was uh, at the Vikings, watching them do skull chant, watching them run out uh, from that tunnel with nobody in the stands. You could see guys like Dalvin Cook and Kirk Cousins and all of those guys like trying to create their own energy because they weren't able to feed off the fans. It, it was a really, really unique season. It, it's something that I, I don't, I didn't hate I definitely disliked it because of things that we did, but I also thought it was a, a new way to adapt and do things. And, and it was a moment in time, hopefully a moment that we never have to repeat, uh, but certainly something that was unique. Yeah, fingers crossed. I know Broncos country here is super excited to get back to Empower Field at Mile High. And I know everyone here in Denver is just super anxious for the season to get underway. Shannon, just to start, what are your thoughts on this you know, Broncos Giants matchup for week one? What excites you about it? Your defense, I mean, I cannot wait to watch <laughs> Bradley Chubb and Von Miller on the field together. I can't wait to see Patrick Sertan back there. I can't wait to see, I just can't wait to see your defense. I think top to bottom, there are a lot of young guys. I, I 
but I feel so old, right? Patrick Sertan, I grew up in Florida and his dad, I watched his dad play when I was younger, obviously watched him play in Alabama. I can't wait to see what he can do. Just getting that perspective from being on the field and seeing the sheer power of those guys is going to be, so I'm, that's absolutely. And then your offensive weapons. I mean, my goodness, if you guys like on paper, the Denver Broncos are just <laughs> loaded. Uh, your, your wide receivers are so uh, special. And I can't wait to see the power that they bring and their ability to create space and their ability to, to uh, just make stuff happen with the ball in their hands. I think it's going to be really, I think it's going to be a tough, tough game for the Giants, especially if some of those key guys aren't playing like Saquon. And I know Kadarius Tony has not been playing in the off season. Uh, Kenny Galladay is amazing. I watched him a lot at Detroit and I know he hasn't been available most of training camp and that offensive line struggles. So I do think it's going to be a tough matchup, but not one that's um, completely impossible for the Giants. Right. You know, one of the most debated topics, obviously here in Broncos country this off season was the quarterback battle. Teddy Bridgewater, he's going to be one leading this offense. What do you hope to see from him this Sunday? Well, I think what Teddy brings is, is what everybody says. A, he's, he's love he's loved, right? Every, he's a team guy. I covered him last year at Carolina a couple of times and you don't mean everyone just loves Teddy. I also think he brings a real calmness and a real, I've been there. I've done that. I know what to do. I know how to get my guys in the right positions and he, in the patience. And that calmness is really felt throughout, not just that front line, but throughout the entire offense. And, and a lot of times throughout the team. And I think that that's really valuable. Um, I thought Drew, you know, I mean, you guys were right there during it. I mean, obviously it took him a long time to make a decision for a reason. I think both of those guys brought a lot of really good qualities to the table, uh, but Teddy certainly has that veteran calmness uh, that I'm, I'm anxious to see on the field. You mentioned the Broncos weapons. Is there one in particular that you are looking forward to seeing most? Um, yeah. So Cortland, I can't wait to see him get back on the field. I just, I think he's got such an incredible story and, and, and I know that the team really rallies uh, around him. I, um, KJ Hamler, I, I read this story, um, about him and Jabril Peppers, like back in the day, I think those two have a history from like when, when KJ was in, uh, in high school. And so I, I talked to Jabril about that today. So I'm excited to kind of tell that story, but I just think there's a lot of speed. And when you see those guys from field level and you really get to see the speed that they create and the way, like I said, the way that they can create that space with some of those guys on the back end, that's when you realize like just how elite these players really are. The speed it's, I, there are times where you just, like the, the biggest thing people ask me all the time, the biggest difference between covering college and the NFL is just the pure athleticism. These are the elite of the elite. And when you have the elite of the elite of the elite, it's, it's noticeable. And, and that's what some of your skilled guys are. Well, you know, you mentioned the speed of these wide receivers, but also the running backs on this team. We have Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams, the product out of North Carolina. We're really excited to see what he can bring to this roster. What do you think those two guys add to this Broncos offense? Yeah, I mean, just the ability. You have to be able to run the ball. You have to be balanced. In order for those uh, those receivers to do what they do, you have to have the threat of a run game. I mean, everyone knows that. Stop the run and, and make them one-dimensional, and, and you can have success. Right. I love Melvin Gordon, so I covered him at Wisconsin and uh, when he was with Corey Clement, and I just think that those two guys, I loved covering those two guys together. I think Melvin is one of those guys, when you see him, you realize why he's so good at what he does because he's just physically... Um, um, so special. And, uh, and I am really looking forward to seeing what those guys can do uh, in terms of creating that balance and giving Teddy the ab ability to really have a two-dimensional offense. You covered Wisconsin? Shannon? I did. Oh, the jump around was the best. <laughs> Such a fun place to be. That's a great college town. I agree. I told my, my niece when she was looking at colleges, I said, you either go to Madison or you go to Athens. Those are the two. Like I wouldn't, I, those are the two colleges that if I had to do it over again, um, just in terms of college towns and sports towns. And um, I love Madison and, and I love Camp Randall. It's one of my favorite, favorite college experiences. Stadium, for sure. Uh, the swamp is awesome too, of course. It is. I, I mean, I'm biased, so I can't really <laughs> say, but. <laughs> Well, Shannon, you mentioned Saquon earlier, looking like he's leaning towards playing this weekend. But, you know, if you're Vic Fangio, do you almost kind of put together two different game plans, you know, depending on his status? Oh, 
Yeah. I mean, I, unfortunately, I think they had a lot of experience with that game plan last year when he wasn't available. And even before he had the, uh, the major injury that put him out, um, the ACL, like he was still dealing with a lot of issues before that. And he'll be the first to tell you that he wasn't hundred percent. I've covered Saquon since his college years. So I covered him when he was elite in college and, and I watched the struggles that he had last season. Um, you know, and, and a lot of it was up here, right. Dealing with an injury that he's never had to deal with before and, and thinking about that and not just playing. And he openly admitted that many times. I, I just hope they don't rush him back because Saquon is so special and, and, and ha- he's a game changer. He is a, a generational player and I, I just hope they don't rush him back. If he's not ready, I wouldn't play him because he's a type of guy. You got to just let him loose. And if he's at all thinking at all about that injury, uh, he cannot be the Saquon that you need him to be. Right. And you're right. The mental parts of that game, is really huge. Cortland Sutton, he's even talked about it, you know, throughout this whole off season that he just needs to mentally not think about his yeah. knee and he'll be right. good to go. Well, and you heard Von Miller say he wanted to get into a preseason game that was not on turf because his injury was on turf. So he wanted to test it out on grass first. I mean, that tells you all you need to know about how much they do think about those moments and kind of getting back out there after a big injury. Well, Shannon, I know you mentioned the defense right off the top today. And I know you talked to both Bradley Chubb and Pat Sertan earlier this week. What did they have to say about this matchup? Well, again, I think Pat is, um, I asked him if he was going to be nervous. I asked him if he gets nervous before games. And, and he did say that he, he gets nervous after that first hit. I think most players will tell you they take that first hit and you just, you just start rolling. I, I'm just looking to see how they all play. Again, there's a lot of youth, but those, those guys, those, that, the, that young, uh, the young guys that are on the team, I think there's like seven rookies. They come from like the elite programs, the Ohio States and the Alabamas. And uh, so it'll be interesting. Uh, Patrick did tell me about like film study and the speed of the game and all of those things, how those are um, different than what he's experienced, obviously at the college level. And, and Chubb, again, I just can't wait to see him lined up next to Von Miller. I, I love the duos. I mentioned uh, Melvin Gordon and, and Corey, and, and I love those duos two guys who are sort of the yin and the yang and um and feed off each other make each other better and and are just such a threat and I think those guys are going to be I I was a Dolphin fan right so Jason Taylor Zach Thomas were two of my favorite when I was growing up and and to see that uh, combination is always a lot of fun for me well Shannon you've mentioned Pat Sertan a few times you know when thinking about this rookie class Pat Sertan seems the least like a rookie he's the guy this year that's going to play outside and nickel and dime packages he is a guy that coach Fangio can really count on to really fill any role that he needs so what does that really say about him and what he brings to this defense well you know he it's funny I asked him his first memory of football and he told me scoring a touchdown when I was five years old. And, and so his first memory, I mean, so he hasn't been doing it just for five years. He's been doing it for 15 years, 16 yeah. years. Uh, and, and he's watched some of the best in the business, learned from those guys, you know, in terms of watching his dad and, and, and growing up in Fort Lauderdale, um, where he went to school, American Heritage and, and the, the schools that are down there, St. Thomas, you know, uh, we know that some great players uh, come from that program. And, and I just think it's, um, you, you learn a different way and, and he is mature, beyond his his years in terms of football smart physically he's also as they I mean they've they've come up with the nickname for a reason um he's built differently than a lot of guys in that position but I do think that uh learning how to play the game and being around the game and watching the guys who do it right, talking to him on the phone, you really got the sense that he has a ton of respect for this game and, uh, and learned from the right people. And it's going, I mean, it's, you'll see it. I mean, you'll see it from day one. There are guys who take a while to win their rookies to get up to speed. And I think it's going to happen really quickly with this defense. In fact, Bradley Chubb told me, he thinks that the identity of this defensive unit will be formed or, or realized within the first two weeks. And that says a lot for coming from a guy like that. Yeah, I love that. And I love the fact that we're going to see Pat Sertan in such different ways. But you mentioned, you know, Von Miller and Bradley Chubb getting back on the field together. What are your expectations for that duo this year? I think they're going to have a lot of quarterbacks running for their lives (laughs) because I think those guys are going to be, uh, if you can't escape one, you're going to have to escape the other. And yeah, I just, again, when you see Hall of Famers, especially with Vaughn, right? When you see future Hall of Famers and you get the opportunity to watch them do what they do best, that's a real treat. And that's uh, something that I don't take for granted. When when I watch Drew Brees play or when you watch Aaron Rodgers play or when you watch, you know, any of these guys, Dalvin Cook or any of these guys who are, um, this is this is what they do best in the entire world. Uh, and that's a special thing. 
-hmm. Quarterbacks beware. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I, yes. <laughs> but especially those two guys. And you know, it's interesting because Bradley told me that Vaughn just seems younger this year. And you wonder as somebody starts to get older and you start to see that sort of the sand running out of the hourglass and you know that you're closer to the end than you were to the beginning, you do get a different type of energy. I'm looking forward to talking to Vaughn. I think we'll catch up with him on, on Saturday with our crew. And I'm really looking forward. I met him one time, so I've never covered him in a game, but I met him one time at a Texas A&M basketball game that I was was covering and it was like right after the Super Bowl when they beat the Carolina Panthers um so I'm, I'm interested in catching up with him again I'm sure he was rowdy <laughs> yeah everyone was rowdy at that time because I think it was like Kentucky at Texas A&M oh, cool. and I it might have been the year that Kentucky was undefeated um so it was uh it was a rowdy time for sure yeah Vaughn does seem like he kind of has a different perspective you yeah. know last year even too before he um, hurt his ankle, but this year as well. And I don't know if that has to do with his baby. He just had a baby Valor. No. So we have to ask him about that too. Yeah. I th he keeps saying that he's at peace and I, that's a word that we haven't heard him use in the past. So whatever at peace means for him, I think it's going to mean better things for Broncos country. Well, I'm a strong believer that when things like in your personal life are, are set, like it almost like the stars kind of align and everything becomes, uh, everything makes sense. And, and as a parent myself, like when you have a child, everything does make sense. Like it just, the world kind of comes into, into a clearer picture. So that would, that's, uh, I can understand it if that's the situation with his, uh, with his baby Valor. Well, Shannon, last matchup question for you. Now, both of these teams really didn't have the seasons or records that they wanted last year, but you know, we're at a fresh start, get to start out on the right foot this season. Who do you think needs this win more this weekend? Oh, I mean, I think Daniel Jones needs the win because I definitely think he's on the hot seat this year. You know, third year, I know that they had a really unique season last year uh, under Joe Judge for the first year, weren't able to kind of really uh, do what they need to do in training camp with COVID. But I do think it's a pivotal year for him, 100%. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be one. Unfortunately, again, he didn't have a lot of his weapons in training camp. He didn't have them preseason. Uh, it, it, it could take some time to build chemistry with those guys in, in live action and who knows how long it'll be for Saquon. And, and we know that offensive line has struggled. So I think there's gonna be a lot of challenges for him, but I think that if anyone needs a win to start the season, it's Daniel Jones. Right. Well, let's switch gears now and dive a little bit deeper into your career. As most of our listeners know here on the snap, one of our main goals is to highlight women's impact in and around the NFL. So Shannon, just to start. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role as an NFL reporter, but also as a NASCAR host for Fox Sports? Yeah, so I, this is actually my fifth year, my fourth, fourth full-time season, but my fifth year covering the NFL for Fox Sports. I did college sports at ESPN. I covered college sports, college basketball, college football for about five years, five years. And I've, I've been in NASCAR since 2006. So 16 years, 15 years in NASCAR. Uh, I host the pre-race show uh, before our Fox broadcasts, which is something I started doing. I think this will be my third or fourth year. Time just goes, poof, like you just... <laughs> You don't even realize like where the time went. Um, but yeah, it's um, all of the things that I'm, I'm able to do at Fox Sports. I'm, I'm so extremely, incredibly blessed to be um, with a company that that really allows me to do a lot of different things. You know, when I first started and I was covering NASCAR for ESPN in 2007, it was really hard to do anything else besides NASCAR. As you guys know, it goes from February to November. It's really hard to do anything else because you're either missing out on this part of the season or missing out on that part of the season. Uh, ESPN did allow me work to work my off a uh, whole off season doing college basketball, which allowed me to move into a, a different space, which was really what I wanted to do growing up. Um, you know, I, I really admired the women who were able to bounce from one sport to the next. And that's what I wanted to do. And so it's been a real uh, priority of mine for my career to be able to do different things. And fortunately, again, I'm, I'm able to do that. See, I love that we can talk football with you, but I wish I could spend the next two hours picking your brain about NASCAR. We'll get to that. Next can. <laughs> so I'll tell you the funny story. I was, I talked to Sterling Shepard today. You, you'll find this funny. And so I talked to Sterling Shepard and I'm putting, I, I, after I talked to each player, I compose an email with all of my, uh, everything that I learned, my question answers, and I send it off to my crew and I was getting ready to hit send. And I was like, something looks wrong. And it said, Sterling Marlin. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh, that's like honestly that's and, and for nascar fans you know who he yeah. is yeah. 
Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, here it goes. Because that is the hardest thing for me to mentally say player instead of driver, um, you know, right. field instead of track, mm-hmm. uh, coach instead of crew chief. Yep. I, I have to pause before I say those things, before I say player, before I say driver, I think I've maybe made the mistake one time um, since I've been doing both, but it's it's something I have to really kind of take a moment and and make sure I'm getting it right. Sideline instead of pit, you know, back. Exactly, exactly. Let's start from the very beginning. You know, what was the path like for you to get to where you are today? It's been a long one. It's been a long one. And it's been a, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's funny. You, you start out and, and you start out. I think everybody does just trying to prove that you belong and learning as much as you can along the way and sometimes faking it, um, it to make people believe that you belong there. And then I feel like one day you kind of wake up and you're like, I, I don't have to pretend anymore. When did that happen? <laughs> you know, when did that happen? When did, you know, how did, when did the 15 years go by? Because you're constantly trying to grow and, 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 and better yourself and become better. And, uh, and it's busy and it has been for the last 15 years. Um, yeah, I think my whole thing started in New York. I moved to New York after college and was able to work there for, for a little bit and then moved here to Charlotte. I was very fortunate to get in at ESPN at the time that I did when they were getting back into NASCAR because I was super green. I remember it took me an hour to read four tracks for a, for a piece because I, I didn't know how to read tracks. I didn't know how to read prompter. I didn't know how to do anything. And ESPN was really good for that because I got the reps that I needed. You know, any kind of cable network is going to give you a lot of reps. And I was very fortunate at the time that I, that I made the move to Fox sports, because I feel like I was really able to grow um, as an individual and as a professional at Fox. So it's been a, it's been a, a long journey, but it's been an awesome journey that I've been really blessed to cover some of, I mean, just, I look back at some of the games that I've covered, some of the events that I've covered, some of the players and coaches and drivers and all of that stuff. And, and it's just, uh, I wish I would have kept a list of all this stuff because it's, it's pretty cool. What do you think the biggest challenge was that you faced along the way? Wow. That's a really good question. Um, I think a proving that we belong, I think for women proving that you belong, you have to get it right. And you don't just have to get it right to prove it to the men. You have to get it right to prove it to the other women. Yep. And we are held to a higher standard because if we get something wrong, like Sterling Marlin, we don't know what we're talking about where it could just be a simple mistake. Um, and, and we're, we're just as guilty because uh, we are just as critical of women as, as men are, because we know we have to, we have to do better. We know we have to get it right. And uh, I think that that was a, a big one. I think navigating um, being a mom, I think, you know, navigating being a mom, being a wife in this industry is also, you have to, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard. I'm, I'm gone a lot and it's a hard thing to navigate in terms of a marriage. And I think the personal side is important to us, very important to us. Cause that's the first question that I get asked from women is like, how do you do it? How did you manage it? Cause it is an important aspect to, to many of us. So I think that those things for sure are, are some of the biggest. And, and I think just keeping everything kind of balanced and, and finding and learning my system of how to do that has been one of the biggest challenges over the years. Yeah, the work-life balance is hard, especially like when you said a lot of women do ask you that, but there's not yeah. one template you can give. Everyone kind of has to find their own balance their own way. Yeah, I think Michelle Beisner Buck, you know, when she was on this podcast, she has twins and trying to balance that and her life with Joe and everything that they have going on. It definitely is. It adds another layer to it that I think a lot of women don't necessarily think about when they're getting into the industry, but then all of a sudden life starts to unfold and you're like, wait, now what's that next step? Yeah. I have twins as well. So they're 11 now, but oh yeah, same thing, you know, and, and I've, and, and I found not, not all women, but most women still want to be that primary caretaker, yeah. still want to be the person that takes the kids to the doctors and, and sets up babysitters, sets up play dates, orders lunch, you know, talks to the teachers, attends. I mean, you still, you know, tuck them in at night, be home every night, be home every morning, drive them to school. And you still want to be that primary caregiver. And, and it's, and, and when you're not, you feel guilty. Like as soon as my kids walk out the door, I'm like, oh my God, I wish they were here. But as soon as they're home, I'm like, I need a break, you know, and it's mommy guilt that you're constantly fighting. And, and I, I do believe that mommy guilt is um, a little different than it, than daddy guilt um, because of just us wanting to be that primary caregiver all the time. And so it is something that you, you battle. And I've talked to Michelle about it. Jamie Little, we, we mentioned um, Laura Rutledge, Allison Williams. Wow. There are so many women 
thankfully nowadays, because I remember when I first started, there weren't a lot of women who had children and, and women that did have children a lot of times got out of the business because they, they moved in that direction. Um, and, and I do think it's, it's a wonderful place that we all are in and we're all supporting each other. I'm the first one to reach out to anyone who, who is coming back from maternity leave, because I know how hard it is. Uh, I know how much guilt you feel. And, um, and just to know that we've all kind of been there and been through it. Well, I know when I'm ready to have kids, I know who I'm there you go. Yeah, yeah, so like, there you go. <laughs> but we are, but we are the cool mommies. I'll tell you that yes, much. You, my, you know, my kids uh, covering sports and um, it's uh, yeah, you're the cool mommies for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, Shannon, you mentioned earlier, you know, you wish you had a running list of every event game race that you've covered in your career. Is there one that kind of sticks out to you as your favorite? I loved covering college football. Uh, I'm sorry, college basketball. So anytime I got to go to the championship, the the final four um, was pretty darn special. I was sitting right behind the bench, the Carolina bench, when Chris Jenkins hit that that shot for Villanova. I mean, I was like right behind Roy Williams. Um, And um, I had to interview Marcus Smart after that. And I remember how, how devastated he was. I was able to spend that 2015 season with the uh, with the uh, Kentucky Wildcats when they were undefeated, got beat in the um, the Final Four by Wisconsin, and, and so being a part of that crew, and you know now seeing those guys go on, Devin Booker was on that crew, um, you know going Carl Anthony Towns was on that crew, watching those guys move on and become great at what they do at the professional level is always pretty cool. Uh, but I did I, I I think college basketball is is one of my true loves. I loved covering it. And, um, those events were pretty cool. So yeah, a lot of those. Well, Shannon, throughout all of your experiences in the sports industry, what advice would you give to women who are really trying to break in? And it doesn't have to be necessarily on camera, uh, but any role really. Yeah. Work hard and be likable. I think that those are the biggest things just work outwork the person next to you, because if you don't, they will and be likable. Uh, we spend a lot of time in this industry, I mean, in any industry, right? We spend a lot of time with the people that we're working with on weekends, on holidays. Um, and it, you don't want to be with someone that, that you don't enjoy being around. And so I think that that is a quality that's really under underestimated and um, undervalued is, is to just be likable, be a hard worker and be likable. Great advice. Well, Shannon, we seriously cannot thank you enough for your time today. It was such a pleasure getting to meet you, get to know you a little bit more. So thank you for joining us on Snap. Of course, anytime. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's episode of The Snap. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure to meet us right back here on the Broncos Podcast Network and YouTube next Friday for another episode. We'll see you guys then.